if you have it plugged in. So, yeah, rolling with the punches here. All right, so, uh, David, um, the number one thing when I was going through all these movies, we've talked about Cool Hand Luke, Star Wars, Alien, the Alien Trilogy with Prometheus and Alien Covenant is what I want to talk about here just a little bit. But uh, I want to skip over all of this because the most important thing is uh, Jonah. And really, there's nothing, anything I talk about is going to be just empty uh, sci-fi fiction uh, compared to Jonah. And so... Uh, we need to get everybody's uh, prior knowledge tuned up for the rest of what you were wanting to say about it. Yeah, I think I think we better do a dramatic reading uh, and just it's a short it's a short book. It's only four chapters. So I thought um, the way you like to put drama into it, I think, would be the best way to do that. All right. I'd, I'd love to give it a shot. Uh, I've always thought I was kind of monotone, but we'll see. I like to read because but it, whenever think, you read Everybody knows the, you know, the gist of the story about Jonah and the whale, but there's a lot of details in there and just a four uh, short chapters. So, yeah, I'm ready if you are. Okay, so I'm going to put it on the screen. You can read from whatever book you're, what, 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 what book are you reading it from? King James Version. So do you want to put it in your version? The- you I got put, the I've new, got it on mine. I can read it from the King James and you can put yours or I don't know. Maybe it'd be better to to read and put the same text up. So I got the new King James version. I'll put it on the King James version. There we go. Okay, ready when you are. All right. Uh, Jonah chapter one. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea, to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come, and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose counsel this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto them, unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was temptuous. And he said unto them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, 
for the sea was wrought and was temptuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Chapter two. Oh, hold on. Uh, is there someone that's uh, got people talking in the background or TV playing? It's me. Can, I'm turning it. I'm turning it down. Just, okay. Chapter two. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said. I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about, and thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about. Even to the soul, the depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, to the, the earth with her bars was above me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observed, they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Chapter 3. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. He did it not. Chapter four, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, 
For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd, but God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Then said the Lord, thou hast had pity on the gourd for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it to grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city? wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot be discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. The end. Mm -hmm. So I don't remember ever hearing the end of that story. Uh, when I was a kid, I heard the beginning a thousand times, but I don't. Yeah, think that, I mean, that's the whole kind of uh, big part of it right at the end with as far as jonah as an individual character within the narrative yeah um i um i watched a a, a rabbi talk about this and there was a lot of extra information in the talmud apparently uh that doesn't appear in our uh english version of the bible uh and the talmud is not the bible it's commentary on the bible from the Old Testament. Um, and I found some interesting things. Uh, but before we get to that, um, let's just look at this last sentence here. Um, there's more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. That's a weird way to end, end that book. Uh, just end, end with, you know, there's all these people, should I not? And they have that much cattle. That's kind of just a weird, abrupt way to end a thought. Yeah, I was thinking that as I was reading it and finishing it up, you know, reading it out loud. You're just kind of like, you kind of want to punctuate it at the end, but it just leaves you. You want to add something. And, and a lot yeah. of people did add something to this book. If you look at the, um, look at all the versions over here. I just took one sentence. Let's look at the prayer that Jonah prayed to get spit out of the fish. <clears throat> Uh, he he was he was basically dead for three days, not unlike the Christ, and he rose again, and he prayed this prayer, and this is when God spit him out on the dry land. Now, my favorite version of all of these was the Aramaic Bible in plain English, and it says, "All who observe empty religions forsake your mercy." Now, that word "the mercy" has been translated a bunch of different ways. If we look at all these different translations here, almost all of them are different. Some of them say kind of the same things, but some of them word it in a way that makes it to where it can completely change your whole religion or your whole what you think about what the what the mission here is. Um, so let me just read a few of them. Oh, for instance, the, the Berrien Study Bible says those who cling to worthless idols forsake his loving devotion. So they take the word mercy and they put in the word loving devotion. Uh, another way to say that is uh, worthless idols abandon their faithlessness, faithfulness. You abandon your faithfulness. 
So that's not about God's mercy at all. That's about something you're doing for God. To abandon your faithfulness, I feel, is not the same as abandon is forsaking your mercy. Those who regard and follow worthless idols turn away from their living source of mercy and loving kindness. That seems like, uh, I don't know. It seems like wishful thinking there that they added that twice. They, they just put, instead of changing the word mercy, they put mercy and loving kindness. Uh, those who cling to worthless idols forsake faithful love. Seems like that could be interpreted a lot of different ways. Why are they talking about idols? Because uh, whenever it says lying vanities, uh, the original text, I believe, is talking oh. about idols. Well, lying vanities is a way that they interpreted idols. I don't know. I mean, that's, I think well, it's this, kind of that's, different. Well, this, yeah, this, is, what you're saying. this is Aramaic here. So this, yeah. this should be contemporary with the Assyrians at the time of Nineveh. And, and so to me, this seems like it would have the most relevance. And it says, all who observe empty religions forsake your mercy. But then again, that's how someone interpreted the Aramaic. Um, there, there was a, quite a few things. Like even at the end when you talked about the gourd, in the ones that I read, it all said a vine. And I never yeah. saw gourd. Well, the, the one thing that stands out to me after having read that is the word prepared. So like in uh, chapter one, verse 17, he says, uh, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. So, I mean, it was already ready to go. You know what I mean? The whole thing was, had already been orchestrated. And then when you get down to the last chapter, chapter four, verses six, seven, and eight, uh, each of them, it says, and the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. And then verse seven, but God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered. And then in verse eight it says, and it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But I mean, it's just like, it's, it's all happening, but it's, it's also mentioning the fact four times it mentioned that God had prepared, you know, the, the next thing. Cause that whole thing. Yeah, I've, heard, thing I've heard some Lord, people say that, that whole chapter four was weird. Huh? I've heard some people interpret that as he came in the form of a fish. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Right. And I wasn't really sure what I thought about that before. So fish, gore, worm, wind. <laughs> um, or it's not a whale. I listened, a whale I, I listened a to a, a rabbi <laughs> talk about. I listened. Say what now? I said a whale's not a fish, though. No, no, it's not. Uh, but uh, I, the, the, the main thing that I got out of my study, um, well, it's like I said, there's, there's a surface version, then there's a more complex version, and then there's the really deep version. So like the middle level version that I thought was profound was uh, the fact that I didn't know that, that Jonah got angry after the people were, the people repented. This yeah. is a, one of the only stories in the Bible where the people actually repented and he, it didn't sit well with him and you, and you, it doesn't really say necessarily why, but it does say that, that um, basically he, he felt that they, that they deserved their wrath of God. He prophesied it. They deserve it. And, and so he's, he's, he's rooting for their demise and whenever God saves them, he doesn't celebrate his mercy on them. And that yeah. seems to be the real point of the whole story. Getting swallowed by the fish, 
and everything else. It, it's a great trial, but you could have you could have taken that whole part of the story out and swapped it with another evil bad event, and it wouldn't it wouldn't you would still get this idea out of it that the whole point is is a lesson for Jonah about God's mercy, and and if people repent right then and there. He's not focused on the future sins they might commit. He's willing to give them mercy right then and there when they ask for it. And, 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 and what this rabbi was saying that I was listening to was saying that when a stranger, when, when a person comes to your door and they are looking for your mercy, that um, you can't be preoccupied with, what they might do in the future, what future sins they might commit. Um, but to just show your mercy right then and there for the fact that they've shown up, the fact that they asked for help, essentially. Right. So even though a person is, let's say, a drug addict, and you know they might go and spend your money on drugs or something like that, um, you know, find a way to give them food or something that they can't spend on, on drugs. But well, this, this to me though, is more about like these people turned, like they can, they repented, they completely like uh, recognized their fault. They were behind Jonah probably because his reputation followed him from being, you know, from the situation when they cast him, you know, overboard, and then he was saved by a whale. I mean, that must have he was totally have known surprised. about him, and then and and so it, it sounded like it brought a fear to everyone. Oh, that because they were they had cast lots, right, to see whose god uh, would show themselves or whatever. Well, I have a couple um, of things to say about that. Uh, first of all, look where Tarshish is. Tarshish is in Spain. And if you look where Jaffa is, J Joppa is the Latinized version of Jaffa. And it's just south of Tel Aviv on the coast of Israel. And then mm -hmm. let's look where Nineveh is. Um, I got a picture of Nineveh and some reason it's not on here. But Nineveh is basically northern Iraq uh, up in uh, far eastern Syria. Mm -hmm. And so this guy is probably one of the most traveled people in the entire Bible. Yeah, um, well, I feel like I feel like he went through a lot of different levels here in this short book because it started out he he, he started out he was afraid, right? And then he ends up going on this boat, right? And then he's just like, just throw me, God's after me because of what I did, right? Just throw me over and save yourselves right and then he and then, then he just completely submits and and he's just begging for mercy inside the whale and he spit out and then he's probably just feeling joyful like completely joyful that he's alive and then he's like he goes straight to Nineveh and starts marching through the streets telling them you've got 40 days you know, just with with bravery and, and boldly, you know, walking through the streets, telling them. And then they they uh, they they repent. Yeah, the king then, immediately takes his crown off and makes everyone wear sackcloth, even yeah. the animals. And he makes everyone do a three day fast so no one can yeah. eat or drink anything for three days immediately. Yeah. That and then there was, a, and then there was no, turn. there was no climax. It was just, it, right. it's just like, it's just it like really how, fun. it's just like how it ends in chapter. Like we were talking about how it just like kind of ends. There's nothing there. Well, that's kind of, I I'm guess how it, how the, how it actually happened. Like it, there was like nothing happened, right? God well, just repents. And well, then there's actually an explanation of that in the Talmud. And I, I discovered something. There's not a lot of information about this, but um, the question is, who's the king of Nineveh and why did he give up so easily? And so let's look at there's a couple of people early on in 
history that that thought they knew who the king of Nineveh was. At least as early as Isubius and Caesar of Caesarea, Ramesses II was identified with the Pharaoh, of whom biblical figure Moses demanded his people be released from slavery. The identification has been occasionally disputed, but the evidence for another solution is inconclusive. <laughs> Ramesses II was not drowned in the sea. And the biblical account makes no specific claim that the Pharaoh was with his army when they were swept into the sea. In fact, Jewish tradition appears to indicate the Pharaoh was the only Egyptian to survive the Red Sea and later became the king of Nineveh in the book of Jonah. So this guy has already seen his entire army destroyed. He saw the entire group of Israel walk across the Red Sea and be saved. And they were known as the people who walked through the sea. And so as the Pharaoh, he's taken over all of Syria and he's spread that everyone knows the story. Everyone knows the story of Moses and, and the, 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 the trek across the, the Exodus. Everyone knows the story of the Exodus. So when Jonah shows up and tells them they got 40 days till their whole city's destroyed, they just fall on their faces immediately because they know it's true. Yeah. 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 So I think, I think at the end, he's just kind of like, he, he goes back to thinking that he went through all that for nothing. You know what I mean? And it made him angry. And he starts thinking, he, you know, he had suffered all this and he's now he's reputa- now he looks bad or something. I don't know. Or like you yeah, said, yeah, it's kind of confusing. Why he, is is it is it his is it his ego that is making him angry? Yeah, something. Or is it because he well, really feels like they deserve they they don't deserve a mercy? And maybe it's just the simple thing of he went from joy to anger. Maybe it's that. Maybe it's that simple. You know what I mean? Like, or or him, you know, or also it's the fact that maybe he feels like he did. Maybe he feels like he got swallowed by the fish and the whole thing was for nothing because right, he, he told yeah. the people that they were going to die and then it yeah. didn't happen. So right. he's, yeah, going, exactly. he's just defeated. Yeah. When, when instead he could have just continued to feel happy that he, he survived, you know? Well, and, let's uh, did you guys, the, the, there's actually a couple of accounts of people really being swallowed by fish and whales and living. There's a guy in just, Three years ago, there was a guy, uh, he was a commercial fisherman, and he was swallowed by a whale. I mean, and, how many times How many times in your life have you, like, you've just been, you've had a situation where you're just, you're thankful to be alive. Like, you're like, thank you, God, that I'm alive. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that could have really been bad. Uh-huh. And then how many times you you just turn right back around and you start feeling sorry for yourself or like you want to complain about your life. You know what I mean? When you've already been given some extra, you know? Yeah. yeah. I think the whole, the whole story of the exactly. Israelites reflects that. I mean, every person feels that individually, but the whole story about the Israelites is about them having the same thing where they Let me- Uh, Can I interject here? Yeah. Um, You know, you were referencing uh, at the first of this about the show um, Pinocchio. Well, isn't it it strange? You know, what wasn't um, his dad and him swallowed by a whale? Yes. That's the whole story of Pinocchio. Okay. So I don't remember. I'd have to watch it again, but I don't remember what all happened when they were swallowed and how they why they were spewed out what did they learn or or anything but then again throw this thought in there when he said um for 40 days you're going to die in 40 days and you're not going to eat and drink well that's just like jesus when he had to fight you know the devil came to him and everything yeah. And he didn't he didn't eat or drink for 40 days. Yeah, true. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. And then I actually have a whole bunch of days, since since we talked yeah. about that earlier, Mom, I've prepared yeah. a bunch of notes about that. Yeah, and the and three I days that he was it. in the well. Three days yeah. he was in that well. And it was the third day that Christ rose. 
Yeah, that's an interesting parallel. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about before. But I bet you that we're gonna, we're going to find as we go through this this next year, we're going to find more and more stuff like that. You know, what? Why are there twelve tribes and twelve this and that and third day and the, yeah. on the second day? You know, just things like that that God keeps putting in front of us from the beginning of time, really. Yeah. So. Let me just put a uh, let me just put a, an idea in your head real quick. Let's go back to the Bible verse, the very first line of Jonah's. Sorry, Jonah one. Jonah one one. I think this right here. I haven't heard anybody else say it, but I have a feeling that this first line says it all. But everyone just looks past it. Amitai? It, no, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Who's the word? Okay, yeah. Right. Oh, Jesus is the word, right? Right. Word of the Lord. They say, that's what they say. In the beginning, the word, in the, in the beginning of creation, the word was with God. So you're, it's, you're referencing that that's Jesus. Jesus came, came to him. him. Yeah. 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 So now, like, it makes you think about where else does it say that in the Bible? Well, I, I can show you. I've got a whole list of notes here about it. So yes. let me go back to Jonah again. And uh, let me just read some places where it's in the Bible. Uh, I'm on the page. It says, I'm on the page underneath uh, Jonah that says, the Jonah prophecy. There's a video here that I watched and I've seen things like this before. This guy does a really good job of talking about it, but I'm going to try to just cover what he said a little bit. So Luke 1130. For as Jonah, Jonah's was a sign unto the Ninevites. So shall also the son of man be to this generation. Luke 1130. 32, yeah. the men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. This is Jesus talking in parables, and people don't understand what he's talking about, but he keeps mentioning Jonah. And then Matthew 16 he says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no, no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah, and he left them and departed. Matthew 24, 1 through 2, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be here one stone left upon the other. Thou shalt not be thrown down. And then you go back to go back to the uh, what mom was saying about the 40 showing up over and over again and three showing up and over and over again. There's something called the day to year prophecy. And here's an example of how it works. After the number of days in which ye search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even 40 years. And ye shall know my breach of promise. So for they they were punished for 40 years for each day that they wandered the desert. So they wandered the desert for 40 days and then they felt they were denied God's promise for 40 years. So that's a day to year correlation that appears in the Bible over and over again. That's just one example. So. In, in the specific thing we're talking about here with Jonah being a, a parallel with Jesus, Jonah spends three days in the belly of a fish. And he, he says he, he was in the heart of the earth. And then Jesus says he will spend three days in the heart of the earth, referencing Jonah. Jonah says Nineveh will be destroyed in 40 days if they do not repent. And they do, and they were spared. Jesus is crucified by the people he prophesies to, 
and they do not repent. But then we find out through history that Jerusalem is destroyed exactly 40 years later. Now, that's the most important part right there, because it's not really in the New Testament. They barely even mention it. Unless you're digging in the Bible and comparing it to history, you could never know that. And Jonah, Jonah, I mean, if this is really, this is can't be a coincidence. If Jonah uh, was, Jonah was written several hundred years before Jesus' birth. And we know that because it was found, the copies of it were found in with the Dead Sea Scrolls back in 1947. And so we have unchanged copies of Jonah that predate Jesus by several hundred years. And the story of Jonah and Nineveh, that would have been a thousand years before Jesus. So how in the world could the writers have predicted that the city of Jerusalem would fall 40 years after Jesus rose from the dead after three days? Right. It's not something that you can fake. And it's the thing is nobody even talks about it. And it's not even the, the, the Bible doesn't. It's all hidden. And I think that's a lot of reason why Jesus talks in parables is because he's talking about the future. And I mean, do you think it's hidden? I mean, it seems like it's pretty. Well, I'm pretty, saying they don't blatantly uh, come out and say it. It's Jesus it's just saying he just mentions Jonah. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I'm, I'm just saying. Uh, you know, it seems like but nobody ever says Jerusalem's going to be destroyed in 40 years. I mean, but he yeah, does yeah. say everything here will be <laughs> toppled. I guess you kind of have to read between the lines. Well, yeah. I don't think it was another thing that Jesus says is that people in the end times would, would know what it means. Okay, so here's some other places where the three appears and some other places where 40 appears. And there's one here I really want to, I think is eerie, that I found. <clears throat> okay, so uh, Genesis 6. Oh, wait, let me go back to the first one. On the first third day, God makes dry land appear and causes vegetation to come up out of the earth, plants yielding seeds, trees, and bearing fruit. That happens on the third day when Jesus, when God makes the earth. Um, and Noah begat three sons, and each of them had three wives. And they take a heifer that's three years old to put on the ark. And don't forget the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Which is not in the Bible, but yes. Um, it's not in the Bible? No. Really? The the even the the word Trinity, nope. Really, uh, the three angels came to see Abraham, and he fed the three of them three loaves. And then later on in Genesis, I think it's Jacob, he sees three flocks, three wise he, men. There's three wives men, uh, wise men. Um, yeah. Three Marys. And then uh, Genesis 29, um, I think this is about Abraham's wife. She, she, uh, I'm not sure. Now with this time, will my husband be joined unto me because I have bore him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. And in the vine, three branches. Okay, this is the part I was trying to get to. This is with Joseph interpreting the dream of the Pharaoh. And he says, and in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. Genesis 40, 12. And Joseph said unto him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. I have never heard that. Haven't heard anybody say that. Hmm. I have, I got to look into this more. And then Genesis well, 40, And 13. then Jesus says, I'm the branch, doesn't he? Yes, we've talked about that many times. Genesis 40, 13 says, Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place. And thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast his butler. 
I don't know what all that means, but the fact that Joseph says three branches means three days. Hmm. Uh, hmm. That never... me. To me, that's just a piece that says when they say three over and over and over again, they're talking about days. Huh. Yeah, it keeps showing up, and it's kind of mysterious why. To me, Joseph saying like it's, uh, there's it's a prelude. It's, it's predicting the coming of Christ, the Messiah. Hmm. The fact that he's going to raise up from the dead in three days. All right, let's look at 40. So you're saying that it's, there's like more than one prophecy within the story. I think there's three prophecies. There's, like I said, there's like surface level. They, uh, people can talk all day long about being swallowed by a whale and they can talk all day long about getting on the wrong boat and they can talk all day long about the surface level stuff. And then you have the underneath lying stuff where like, why was Moses, why, why was Jonah angry? You know, and you can talk about the psychological, like what God was trying to get Jonah to understand. But then you have this third deeper story that is a prediction of the future. I mean, the whole story about the whale and the three days in the belly of the whale, it was all it was all a prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. And I think I think the key to all of it, the key to all of it is right in the very first sentence that we looked at, that the word was with Jonah. Yeah. So. Some people say that just means that he, he prophesied. Some people just say, say, oh, well, he had the prophecy come upon him. That's what like the, the recycling of, of God's intervention. Robert, tell, tell us, to, tell us about spend, that guy you were telling me about. Word. I think it's like what Robert was telling me about. There's a, there's a character in a movie called Vandal Savage. Robert, tell us a little bit about Vandal Savage. Oh, a man Vandal Savage. He, he's a DC character in comic books and cartoons. It was born like 30,000 years ago. Became immortal through radiation from like a meteorite or something. And proceeded to live forever. And he wow. reappears, he reappears he throughout about, history. Yeah. But like another thing we talked about, I don't know if you I mean that was that movie uh about a guy who was immortal and lived forever but uh, he had been you know mistakenly referred called jesus and everything throughout the movie he lived so long that he was the one that was crucified and everything people thought he, he you know he was basically jesus but he was trying to explain to those people that uh you know it wasn't a messiah or anything it's just i was immortal and they crucified me and i woke when i woke up a few days later i just got left and got out of there is that what the one you're talking that about? you were talking about i can never remember something like man in the moon or something it seemed like that was a movie about the guy from taxi driver or taxi the movie man in the moon wasn't that that was yeah uh, it was the guy that that jim was jim carrey, carrey. Was. yeah it was it was something about the title of us had something to do with man and moon or something well, I, I think there's a strong possibility that um, we, David, we've come back to this over and over and over again. The idea of Christ reincarnating over and over and over again and reappearing, or or transmutating, possibly like he did on the Mount Mount Hermon, where where Elijah and Moses yeah. were there with him, shape shifting. We definitely have some some. Um, you know, it, it maybe it's just the souls. Where did we come across that it was talking about his form? He came in the form of something or whatever. Well, in the form of a dove, there was something about that too. The Holy Spirit, comes, like there's what, yeah, where the, where it comes in the form of this or that or whatever. So the Holy Spirit is the one. I mean, it, and then if you're talking about the Trinity, like Jan was saying earlier, you know, I mean, I mean, so you had the Holy Spirit. That is the the Holy Spirit is the Word. Okay. And God is the creator. And Jesus was the physical form that was here on earth 
that sacrificed itself. Like, like Jonah, he said, throw me overboard and your lives will be saved. And that's exactly what Jesus did is he, he, he sacrificed himself for our sins and rose in three days. And that's exactly what happens to Jonah. He says, the storm's my fault. If you'll throw me off the boat, the storm will stop. And it does. And then he is saved by the fish. And three days later, he spit out on dry land. Now, that was a long trek. If he went to Nineveh right away, like you said, David, then that fish took him all the way from Spain all the way to Lebanon and spit him out right in the perfect spot where he could walk up to Nineveh. That'd be something right there. I mean, if that smart whale swam 2,000 miles and put him right on the perfect beach to walk up and go to Nineveh. Is yeah, I mean, do you th- I mean, do you think there were people there, you know, that witnessed it? You know, he, he just that you just get spit out on the beach and he just shakes it off, you know, or whatever, <laughs> and they have to help him. I mean, because it's pretty much the next thing. He just goes walking through the streets. There, right? There's a boy in Sweden who was swallowed by a a uh, whale. And apparently um, the only damage he had was he was um, – his skin was – was uh, had lost all of its pigment because of the acid in its stomach. Yeah. Hey, that movie is yeah. The Man from Earth. Man I've heard of that. The Man from Earth. Let's look at the poster and see what it looks like. I think I must have seen that. That's not related to the Vandal Savage character. Uh, that poster doesn't look familiar to me. But I have heard us. I've heard of that somewhere. Now, uh, I just want to I just want to take a a brief uh, jaunt into the fact that all of this was in the Alien movie. I'm not a big fan of Alien movies. I don't keep bringing this up because I like Alien or because I'm a fan of the show or anything like that. I just find it. Uh, Very fascinating how much of this movie is biblical and none of us have known it. They've had three, three, had three shows in the original series. Then they had Prometheus one and two. And then they had um, um, Alien Covenant. So they've had a total of six movies now and no inclination whatsoever on the surface that it has anything to do with being biblical, in my opinion. But uh, I did a deep dive on it. And I just want to take you to my notes real quick and show how it kind of goes along with everything we've talked about in the Bible. So uh, Ridley Scott is the director and it says Alien Trilogy, Prometheus and Alien Covenant are based on the Bible. This is my presentation here. I just I clipped this out of videos I saw on a YouTube video where I talked about it. Here's the original video. The original video is called Hidden Easter Egg Symbolism and References in Alien Covenant. Uh, so here's the picture of the, the director. This is Ridley Scott. And as you can see here, there's a, a Christmas tree on the, on the uh, t- uh, pool table. And uh, they're heading towards, like we said last week, it was uh, LV234, something like that. It refers The planet refers to Leviticus 23.4 or something like that. And uh, it's all about uh, the original sin of man. And, uh, for some reason, every time they go somewhere in this movie, they go, they end up there on, uh, on Christmas When they go back to earth. They end up on Christmas day. When they go back out on the ship, it's, I guess when they arrive at LV two thirty three or whatever, it's Christmas day again. So you keep getting these references all throughout. Um, so this guy right here, the main plot, this guy, Walter, makes androids. And he feels like he's playing God because he has created life that will exceed his own. He's going to die soon. That's kind of the whole plot of the movie is he's going to die soon and he wants to live forever. So he's trying to go to find the creators so that he can learn the secret of everlasting life. 
And he thinks that he is a God or deserves to live because that's what he actually says to the creator when he finds him is that he deserves to live forever because he has created life just like the creator did. And so this is really the, the Edens, the story of the fall uh, of the devil and, and Eden uh, and being cast out of the paradise. Here you can see this is the android David. And in the background, you can see a painting uh, from the Renaissance period, and it depicts the nativity scene of Jesus. So this guy, he was not born uh, because he's an alien. He is basically immaculate conception. So they're drawing a parallel between this alien, this uh, this android and Jesus. Now, what he finds out. This is, these are the engineers. These are basically pre-Adamites we talked about. They're huge, massive giants. They're the Nephil, Nephilim. And uh, they created um, humans. This guy right here, he drinks this black ooze, and he immediately his face starts like deteriorating and smashing, and then he falls dead into a waterfall and his blood mixes with all the water on earth and it instantly starts to create life. So like all life on earth was created by this black ooze. Now, the fact that it makes these xenomorphs, that is um, that's a mutation. It's a it's a it's not not all life goes that way. Basically, this explains evolution. And they're saying this that. that the, we ourselves were made from the black ooze, but when you mix our DNA with uh, the alien DNA, it makes these horrific creatures called xenomorphs. And now the whole story, uh, it basically is that because um, of we were put on, we were put in paradise by these engineers, and um, we were evil. And they wanted to teach us how the meaning of life. So they took a person and they took them to their home planet and taught them how to love. And they taught them the meaning of life and, and, and how to live in paradise. And what happened? Humans killed the guy. And so the engineers created the xenomorphs in order to destroy humans on earth because we killed the chosen one. So the whole book, the whole story, the whole thing originally in the dialogue and everything was about Jesus and someone high up in the production level decided they didn't want that in there and made him take it out. What was the planet? uh lv233 or something like that i was just looking like leviticus i thought you said 223 so i looked up chapter i looked up chapter 22 verse 3 i didn't know if there's some correlation between that verse and you know the meaning behind some of the movie Yes, it, it's 223 probably. Let's see, LB. There's LV 426. No, here, there, there it is. LV 223, you're right. Yeah, because up there at the top says Leviticus 22.3. But in the Bible it says, say to them, if any man from any of your descendants throughout your generations is in a state of uncleanliness, yet approaches the holy offerings that the Israelites consecrate to the Lord, that person will be cut off from my presence. I am Yahweh. You know, a lot of directors, like in their movies, take some of their, you know, whether it's their personal beliefs or take other little bits that they want to just throw in and hide. Just like if it's, you know, LV223, maybe there's some sort of significance in that chapter 23 verse. 
chapter 22, verse 3. It seems like a, kind of a stretch, but I could see if to me, I, I need to do more research on Ridley Scott to see how religious he is. I'm surprised that these uh, science fiction writers are so uh, biblical based on their writings. But I, I wonder if it goes back to we talked about last week um, about um, what books uh george lucas had on his desk when he was writing star wars and one of them they mentioned was a it was like a science fiction biblical guide and i think i'm not if i'm not mistaken it was written by gene roddenberry or somebody like that um who's the guy that's the guy that wrote star trek uh i have to go back and read i have to watch last week's episode and see what they said but um there was a book I wonder if, if it's maybe not the Bible that they're referencing, but some science fiction book that was written in the 60s that was about the Bible. A lot of them may be pulling stuff out of the Bible, too, just for there's a lot of good stories and they can take them and kind of put their own twist on them. It's kind of like George Lucas said. He he said uh, he, he thought it was strange himself that he was a Jewish kid writing Christian stories. And uh, it makes me wonder if there's not some, and I, and I think I think we talked about it last week. I'll have to go back and watch it. Uh, but I think we talked about a certain book that he had on his desk that was about biblical narratives. It, you almost can't get around, like if you're if you're trying to create a sto- a story of a hero, you can't get around it. The self sacrifice, you know, and then the yeah, it's. Yeah, it's not okay. just the Bible, but, you know, all the stories that these guys draw from, you know, just whether you're writing a book, whether you're doing music, you're influenced by the things that you like. It's like, you know, King Arthur, that was a boy who, you know, a young man who was the chosen one to lead a nation, you know, it, it, it's the same story that's been told over and over and over. Well, that brings me, what you just said is a good segue into Superman. Uh, The Superman narrative closely aligns with the Moses narrative. Uh, Let me read just some of this, some of the connections here. One one way, can't talk. One influential use of Moses in pro-American propaganda was through the comic book hero Superman. Siegel and Schuster submitted Action Comics number one under the pseudonym Bernard J. Kenton. They were Jewish kids channeling their religious anxieties through comic books. Borrowing from Greek mythology, Arthurian legends, science fiction, Edgar Rice Burroughs, principal themes are drawn from the Old Testament with a backstory almost point by point. Moses was born into a world where people faced annihilation. Baby Moses is put into a small basket and floated down the Nile by his mother. Moses is rescued by the daughter of the Pharaoh. Moses is raised in an alien environment where he must conceal his true identity. Moses receives a calling from God to use his powers to deliberate his people from to liberate his people from tyranny. In a study of Bruce Failer, 2009, he reports Superman's name reflects his creator's biblical knowledge. Moses is the leader of Israel. Yisrael in Hebrew translated as one who strives with God. El was a common name for God in the ancient Near East and appears in the Bible like Elohim and El Shaddai. Kal El in Superman comic means swift God in Hebrew. The mythology of Superman and the Bible story of Moses provides a symbolic gesture of strength and independence that holds a particular meaning for us. It's rooted in an existential idea of embracing one's destiny and overcoming obstacles through endurance. (coughs) We all need general convictions that give meaning to our life and enables us to find a place for ourselves in the larger universe. We can all withstand the most incredible hardships when we are convinced 
and that those hardships make sense and are worthwhile endeavors. Hmm. I was looking at uh, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Just now I was reminded of that. I think we had mentioned it before. Yeah, Robert and Mom were talking about that quite a bit last week. Which C.S. Lewis, he's an interesting person, you know, because he was a he was an atheist. At, he was at one time. Yeah, he. That. It says uh, he said he was re- raised in a religious family that attended the Church of Ireland. It says he became an atheist at fifteen, though he later described his young self as being paradoxically very angry with God for not existing and equally angry with him for creating the world. <laughs> well, typical well, that's really old. dark. Yeah. <laughs> He's an interesting character. Uh, you guys so I don't, I don't, I don't know gonna... what, I don't know what his theology was at the time that he wrote, you know, the Chronicles of Narnia, but obviously, I mean, his, his Christian upbringing had an influence on his science fiction writings. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I do want to talk about C.S. Lewis some more at some point. Uh, but uh, my battery is about to run out, so I'm going to have to plug yeah. this thing in. Um, I, I've been trying to get to the parables of Jesus for two weeks, and that's what I want to do next week. Oh. Can, you do one? Can you do one real quick? Yes, please. Before we break away. Yeah. I'd like to just talk about one that I planned on talking about last week. Um, the parable of the sower. Yeah. Let David say his part before you run out of battery. Okay. I don't I, I, uh, with the, I've talked about this a lot with the, it's the king that, you know, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus preached. Math starting in Matthew. Matthew 13, 24. The parable of the sower explained. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received received seed by the wayside. But he was re, he who received seed on a stony. Let's see. Let me start that over. This is who received seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, it immediately he stumbles. Now he, re- now who, he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So we have a person who is living well. But it's an easy, it's an easy path. It's easily picked. It's right there for them. Then you have someone who it's a rocky place. There's not a lot of there's not a lot of uh, biblical teachings in their life, and and they don't have a place to put down their roots. He says this person immediately reacts good to the message receives it with joy, but has no root in himself and only endures for a little while. So we're talking about people who are following the word. So 